So, uh, I, you know, I, I, I've been amiss. I'm sorry, I have to apologize at the very front. Um, you know, during Lent, since we started this last year, we started calling this penance with the priest instead of Bob the Father. And I've been calling Bob the Father all through Lent. But welcome to another edition of Penance with the Priests. Um, since we, you know, I just want to keep the tradition going from, from last year. Uh, the same structure, though, there's really no difference between Penance with the Priests and Bob the Father. It's an open discussion, open questions. Um, we kind of start, started a little bit here, just talking a little bit about the liturgies and uh, also about like the difference between like feast days and the old old calendar compared to the structure of liturgies now. We have like you know you have regular what we call ferial days, uh, memorials, feast days, solemnities, and day, holy days of obligation are always solemnities too. So. Um, it's a little bit different than it was back in, in the time before Vatican II. You would have kind of more um, what they call uh, requiem masses during regular days. You'd always have the, 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 the seasons of Lent and Advent and Christmas and Easter. Um, but you would have more feast days rather than like those higher degrees of feast and solemnities. Um, so the question was raised, well, back before Vatican II, um, well, this, this upcoming Friday we have a solemnity. Uh, the, the, the Solemnity of the Annunciation, which means because it falls on a Friday, you are exempt from abstaining from meat, which if you guys want to have a steak that day or, you know, have a hamburger, you can do that. Because it goes back to the practice of the church where we don't fast when we feast. So if we have a feast day, we feast, right? Regardless when it falls, Sundays are feast days. You always, you never shouldn't fast on Sundays. Um, these higher elevated days, such as like, you know, uh, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption and the Annunciation and Christmas, right? Those are all feast days. So you don't fast on those days. Um, that's always kind of been a practice of the church. Uh, so I, I would imagine that was also the case before Vatican II. Um, I think now it's more explicit. Maybe it wasn't as, uh, you know, evident maybe back before Vatican II. But uh, so yeah, so this upcoming uh, Friday, even though it's a Friday in Lent, uh, it would not be you would not be under the penalty or the, the the edict of mortal sin if you were to actually eat meat this Friday because of the nature of that day. So um, yeah, so I kind of give a brief crash course on that, and I would imagine that was the same thing before Vatican II, but it probably wasn't promulgated as much. Right, because you know, there's still something about the the nature of the season that is good and important and um, should be valid. But the, the the church has always said you don't you don't fast on feast days. So I think that would even apply for solemnities that or are these what we call feast days in the old calendar that would fall during the week. And the, the the rule of thumb is if you're celebrating a high mass on the day, that would be a feast day, right? So in the old form, you'd have these kind of elevated masses. You had a low mass. High Mass, you really had a, a Misa Cantata, which was more all sung. Um, typically, if you had that on a given day, that would be the sign that there would be, it would be a feast, in which case fasting would not be something you want to do. Right? Or abstaining. Or abstaining. But the same same thing, right? That we're, we're saying we're abstaining from something, we're fasting from something. And so the church said, no, that's not good to do on these days because these are days of celebration. You know, for Friday we're celebrating the fact that we're celebrating the fact Jesus was conceived, the yes of Mary, the fiat, right, which is a wonderful moment for all of us. That's when God became one of us. That's something to celebrate. So, um, yeah, and of course, this past week on Saturday uh, we had the feast of Saint Joseph, the Sunday of Saint Joseph, which also was a day where uh, fast feasting was to be um, done. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too, in this. And it's always this always been the tradition of the church as well that the, the solemnities of these high days, these feast days, always start on the evening before. So, uh, for instance, for, for the feast of the Annunciation or the solemnity of the Annunciation coming up on Friday, that starts Thursday night. So, once you celebrate evening prayer one for the, the solemnity of the Annunciation on Thursday night, it is then the Annunciation. Is there a reason or a history to why it starts the evening before? That goes back to the Jewish uh, understanding of the days, right? So for Jewish, for Jewish people, the day started at sundown and ended at sundown, right? We, as the new Israel, right, 
taking on the mantle that given to us by Jesus Christ. Uh, we recognize that not every day really falls in that circumstance, but for these for Sundays and for solemnities, we celebrate as if it started on sundown the day before and doesn't end until midnight or 11.59 the following day. So next year when it falls on Saturday, mm -hmm. after the first evening prayer on Friday, you can go have a burger. That's correct. That's correct. Remember that. Now the question is, who's, <laughs> based on when who celebrates evening prayer, right? So could that be your pastor? Is that a commun community? Is that you personally? I think mean, it's my pastor. I think he does it about four o'clock. Well, I mean, so that's you, you know, that's something you're probably able to ask, right? I mean, that's a good question to ask. Because um, you can celebrate, anyone can celebrate evening prayer. Anyone can pray evening prayer. Right. So once you, if you pray evening prayer individually, it's done the solemnity of the Annunciation for you. So great. Only if you pray the evening prayer. Well, see, that's, that's the question, right? So, the, the, you know, we all, as Catholics, always want to know, okay, what's, what, what's the, the rule, right? What, what, is, what is the actual standard, right? Uh, and that's one of the problems with this is that, well, it's individually, right? So you can kind of decide when that happens. Now, generally speaking, we probably want to look at the Sunday schedule. So here in the Archdiocese of St. Louis, there is a, uh, a law that dictates that we don't celebrate Mass before 4 p.m. Right. on Saturday night. So I think that may be the standard you probably want to follow, right? Is that different in other dioceses? It could be, it could be. The bishop uh, has some autonomy to decide that, right? Um, some bishops may say, yeah, whenever your pastor celebrates evening prayer, great, right, that's it for you. Um, but that's what we have in the Archdiocese of St. Louis. So I would say 4 p.m. probably would be a good rule of thumb. Um, but if you want to celebrate, you want to celebrate evening prayer at 3 p.m. Well, that's your call. I mean, that's up to you. Is that really evening prayer at that point? You know, hours should correspond to the hours. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So something to keep in mind, though. Good. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns, heresies? We are hearing in the Gospels and the homilies a lot about forgiveness. That we are. And I was thinking in relation to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve, it doesn't appear as if they got a second chance. Whoa, whoa, interesting. So are you saying... It are you saying that they were never they were not forgiven of the sin they committed? Is that what you're saying? This seems that way anyway. It's well, yeah, it seems that way. Okay, I would uh, posit that that let's let's maybe look at that story. So we have two actually we actually have two stories in Genesis right. of the very beginning, right? We have the um, Elois version and the Yahweh's version, right? The actual second chapter of Genesis actually is more ancient. And that's actually more particular. But they're not contradictory to each other, right? One's more like a thousand foot view, the other one's more kind of like, you know, ten foot view. But the, the, the question at hand really is coming from chapter three of Genesis, which actually uh, is the story of the fall. Now, let's just read briefly what happens after Adam and Eve eat from the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fruit of life. Um, here it is. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made one cost for themselves. When they heard the sound of the Lord God walking about in the garden at the breezy time of the day, the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have forbidden you to eat? The man replied, The woman who you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, so I ate it. Now what's interesting about this passage is it seems like God gives him two opportunities to seek that forgiveness. First off, where are you? Did God really not know where they were? Or was he trying to give them an opportunity to kind of confess 
and receive his mercy. And then to say, um, well, did you guys eat? Who told you you were naked? Did you guys eat of that tree? The tree? But what does Adam do? Not, Flames Lord, I'm sorry I did that, yes. It was her fault. And then she said, well, it's a snake. <laughs> so it seems that God was given an opportunity to repent and to be forgiven. Yet they persisted in their sin. Now, the problem now would be because of that infinite break, there should be some type of way to reconcile that, right? <clears throat> now, doing that right away would be condoning what they did and condoning the fact that, that Adam and Eve also persisted in their sin. Now, you could say the next generation, okay, you got Cain and Abel. Okay, here's another shot, right? But if we read about that story, of course, Cain slew Abel. And again, God says, where's your brother? And again, gives him the opportunity to repent, but he doesn't. So what that tells us is that initial sin of Adam and Eve had a repercussion all throughout the generations that follow. And so now God's plan shifts he may have held ahead this plan to begin with. He knew this was going to happen. But he has a better way for us to actually reconcile with him. Namely, to send his son to us. And we trust as church that Adam and Eve were taken to heaven, but it, it required the Savior to come and do that for them. We profess in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus descended into hell. Well, why would he do that? Well, we believe that he did that to free the Old Testament saints, including Adam and Eve. So they, initially, they did get their reward eventually, but it, caught, it, it required God to become one of us to reconcile that initial sin back to God. Does that make sense? I never heard that before. Mm. Okay, but even at that, God gave them two chances, and that's 77 times 7. Well, who's to say he didn't? Once they started blaming each other, right? Well, I think what, what that tells us is that Adam and Eve realized the repercussions of their actions. And notice they never actually asked for forgiveness in the Bible. <clears throat> they never pleaded for that. They just accepted what God gave them and said, okay, I guess we're going to have to toil the land, I guess. She's going to have to deal with, you know, birthing pains that were very severe. And the snakes are going to have to crawl around and eat dirt all day. Okay. But then God comes to the next generation and gives Cain an opportunity to actually confess his sin and ask forgiveness. But he persists as well. And we're told that it wasn't until Noah, Noah, which was several generations later, was actually a righteous man that deserved to actually maintain the line of humanity. And so this, this sin that Adam and Eve did, it permeated throughout all generations and all people. But the problem is Noah, he couldn't he couldn't reconcile either at that point. He didn't have the capacity to do it. And neither could Adam and Eve because they lost that capacity anyway in their sin. That's, I mean, that's, that's really the issue. An infinite, an infinite uh, offense needs to have an infinite um, reconciliation. And the only way he could do that was God. So how could God do that? Well, he does in the most perfect way he possibly can. He becomes one of us. But God made them aware of what they did. Sure he did. Now, well, they were already aware of what they did. Okay, but he, he deliberately... What, 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 yeah, but what God did was respect their, their free will. Could God have forced them to say, like, yeah, we fessed up, we sorry we did this? Sure he could have. But he still loved them in the midst of it. 
and when did that love reciprocate it? So we respected Adam and Eve's free will in that action, as he does with us all. Okay, so when we are asked, even told, that we must forgive, mm-hmm. let's say somebody did something that offended me. Yep. As part of it, do I have to go tell them? You offended me, but I forgive you. Well, so that's, yeah, yeah. I mean, because part of that is, is there, maybe that person isn't even aware. even aware, right? I never heard that before either. Yeah. It was like, if you offended me and I say, oh, I'll forget about it. You could, I, you could. So yeah, I mean, so here's the thing. If, if you, so we have to understand there's, there's, there's gradations of forgiveness, right? So the lowest form of, of forgiveness that we all need to reach, right? To be, to re- not just for the sake of that person that's being forgiven, but for our own sakes, right? Forgiveness is not for the person that we're forgiving. Forgiveness is for the good of our soul, right? And the lowest bar that we're all called to meet is at least not want any harm to come to that person that offended us. That's low strong. Right, minimum requirement. Okay. Now the maybe the step up from that is well, I want maybe some good for that person to come to that person. Maybe I want the best things to come from that person. Maybe I want I, I want to pray for the best things for that person. And the highest form of that forgiveness would be reconciliation. But here's the thing: in certain relationships, reconciliation may not be healthy to maintain. Right. You think of a uh, a husband and wife where there's abuse, maybe, right? Well, they can forgive each other and may not want any harm to come, and even be sorry for what they've done to each other. But we would say it probably would be healthy for that relationship to be maintained. In which case, reconciliation would not be necessary in that circumstance. But we at least have to get this bottom wrong. Now, of course, it's better for a person to seek that from another person, right? To recognize their, that they offended and seek that, but maybe in their own ignorance they didn't realize it. In which case it could be an act of charity for you to bring to their attention. And say, look, I'm over this and I forgive you, but you did this. And not, it, that's the benefit of the other person. They realize their actions and help come to a better self-knowledge to avoid it in the future with other people. Right? So forgiveness is an act of charity on both parts. Never thought of it that way. Yeah. Good. Great. Any questions, comments, concerns, heresies? Or any other follow-ups on that? It's a lot to digest, I understand. I'm kind of amazed because that's what you're saying is kind of new to me. Mm. I mean, thinking through it that way. Yeah. I, I'm thinking that some people might even become angry when you maybe tell them that this offended me. me. And they'll say, I never meant to do that. It's better with you. Yeah. You don't act right. Well, and here's <laughs> the thing, right? I mean, anger is one of those things where anger can actually be a virtue or a vice. Right. Well, we talk about virtue. Virtue is always the tone of voice matter. <laughs> well, virtue is always the mean between two vices, right? So when we talk about righteous anger, okay, um, on one side is what we call malicious anger, right, and on the other side is more indifference. Righteous anger is sort of the mean between those two. So. What I mean by righteous anger would be um, take Jesus in the temple when he was driving out the money changers. Would we say that he was angry? Yes. Yes. Now, because he's God, he cannot sin. Right? So that anger then would not be a vice. It would have to be a virtue. And the reason it's a virtue is because his anger was not directed towards the destruction of the other or coming from a place of hate. 
He was coming from a place of love, being directed towards the elevation of the other person. I want to show you you're doing wrong, and this is the only way I can do that. For your good. Because I love you. That's, that's, that's righteous anger. And that can be virtuous. It is virtuous. That's much different than, well, how dare you tell me that? That's not, well, okay, that's, that's, self, that's defensiveness. Right? That's a protection of the ego. That's not an act of charity. Because in the humility, you would recognize, I've offended you. I should be sorry for that. And I am. It's actually, the, what you're explaining there would be more pride. Right? And that would be wrong too. To receive correction, for no correction, is also virtuous. And that from charity. But you can still forgive them regardless. That's, you have the control over that, not them. That's still an act of charity on your part. And it's an act of charity to bring them, to fraternally correct them and bring that to their attention. But if they receive that in the wrong way. Yeah, so, so there's ways you can maybe look at how you, based on the relationship you have, you have that person, mm -hmm. you're probably using prudence, another virtue, could deter, decipher what the best way to approach that would be. Or even to approach it at all. Right, but regardless, you can still forgive them. And yeah, you could, that could be a fear, not necessarily fear, but that could be something that you want to actually be kind in the way you approach it, and but also be truthful. <clears throat> and that's where our prudence comes into play. Well, Jesus wasn't particularly kind. No? Well, let's say this way this way. Jesus wasn't particularly nice, but he was always kind. Right? Kind kind kindness and niceness are two different things. Kindness is always in line with charity and truth. Niceness not always is in line with truth sometimes. You know, it could be it could be just oh, I want to save your feelings. It's nice to want to save someone's feelings. Right? That's nice. So would you That's say, not always kind. Would you say truth is always kind? Truth is always kind. To tell the truth is always an act of fortitude and charity. Hmm. To receive it is also an act of fortitude and charity. But it's not always nice. Yeah, and this niceness thing, I mean, that's kind of something that's permeated in society. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not good to be nice, right? I mean, if you can be nice and kind, be nice and kind. But the problem is sometimes niceness and kindness contradict each other. And so being kind, being in line with charity and truth, is always going to be a virtue. Being nice may or may not be. So God doesn't necessarily want us to be nice. He wants us to be kind. Correct. Nowhere in the Bible do you see nice as a virtue or as a gift of the, or a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's good to be I nice think if you I, can I considered be. it a synonym. But. Yeah, and see, that's what I'm saying. And I think most people do think it that way. But Jesus wasn't nice, but he was always kind. Dictionary say about being nice. Well, even the dictionary, though. I mean, so a lot of these are going on to the classical definition, right? And so you're talking about biblical terms where nice is not in the Bible. Well, could you have, could you correctly say, on that occasion Jesus was mean? Mm -hmm. What occasion? In the temple? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because. It'd be mean if you were trying to be wrathful. Oh. Or mean if he's trying to be, you know, if he's just being angry, irrationally being angry, but he's not. Mean is irrational. Right, yeah. The synonyms for nice are pleasant, likable, agreeable, personable, charming, delightful, amiable, affable, friendly, kindly, 
kindly, good natured, engaging, gracious, sympathetic, understanding, compassionate, good, nasty. Antonym. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so that's what I'm saying. I mean, but even, I would even say there's things between all those other terms, though, too. Like being gracious, understanding are two different things. Right. Right. And so, yeah, maybe in, in, in secular terms, they probably are used interchangeably, right? But there are distinctions between those terms right. from a philosophical and theological standpoint. So by the same token, in the Garden of Eden, God wasn't mean. No. He was trying to give an opportunity to repent. He was trying to give an opportunity to actually turn back to him and receive the, that mercy. But they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, well, all right. I mean, that's why, that's why that's why we talk about justice and mercy, right? Sometimes we think those are contradictory, but they're not. You can be just and merciful, right? I can say, you really offended me, but I'm going to forgive you. But you know what? Um, I'm not going to forget, right? Or can you say, but... Um, you broke into my car. I still want you to repair the damage. Of course, I forgive you for that. But you know, I still have this, this damaged car, and in justice, you owe me. You have to give me what I'm due, right? By the offense you did. And we we see that. But here's here's the, the struggle because we can give each other mercy, just like God gives us mercy, right? We can do that. We can give each other justice, but we can't give God justice. Right? Which means any punishment we receive is just. It's just. Our sins offend just like Adam and Eve's sins offend. They have an infinite repercussion. But God, in his greatness, sheds his mercy upon us. He allows us to receive that grace if we just ask for it. But that also means there are consequences not only for we can't we can't give God justice, but we give each other justice. And that's what we see in the sacrament of reconciliation. Right? That's the whole point of the penance. It's a, it's, a, it's a physical sign of our repentance, but also it's a way for us to actually uh, re, um, reconcile with the community. To pay back what would be what we're owed to the community for the effect of our sin. So, for instance, when Jesus told the story of the of the rich man who forgave his his servant all all the debts from this morning's gospel, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the servant was the servant supposed to forgive his debtor all the debts as well? Well, yeah. I mean, look. look so here's the whole point of that story was the the the, the first servant had no way. A pain that, and really, it would be just for that master to sell him off and sell his family off. He had every right to do that, and that would have been the only way to repay. That would be the only way to repay, and even then, it wouldn't recuperate everything that the servant not owed. So, just as he received that abundant mercy, the mercy he was required to give that you know, that other servant was minuscule compared to the mercy he received, <clears throat> and he still didn't do it. Right, and so that's not charitable. That's not kind. That's not virtuous. So therefore, you know, he deserves justice then, which he does. I mean, it's really more kind of like it's really logical. It's really a logical examination. If we were to receive such mercy, that let's say we had a debt. That, well, let's say Jane owes me ten dollars. Yeah. And I say, Jane, I forgive you that ten dollars, but sometime or another, I still want it back. Have I really forgiven her? Well, but see, I think the, the the difference here is that that's kind of falls short what the story is trying to convey. The story would be more like, um, okay, look, um, Marilyn, you owe me twenty billion dollars. Impossible. Okay. But I know you can't pay that back. You know what? 
Don't worry about it. But then you go to Jane Jane. Jane, you owe me $10. How dare you? Give me that $10. I mean, there's a lot. There's a, there's a, a rationale there that's not present. That you receive this great gift. And instead of being overjoyful for that gift, you then go out and persecute another person. Right? There's a disorder there that's not good. That's irrational. It's not line of reason. And therefore, it's not virtuous. Because our response to the circuit should be gratitude. Right? Because here's the thing. Why do you need the $10 anymore? You have no more debt. You're whole. You're even. So why would it matter if Jane owes you $10? Make sense? Kind of. Okay. But what I owed you at that point is it's a mathematical thing. It's gone. It's in a, you know, what you gave me is gone. You spent it. Where yeah. Whereas what I gave <coughs> Jane, she can come up with eventually. Yeah, but the question is okay, but the, the idea would be you ideally would probably use whatever Jane was gonna give you to pay me back. Oh, no. Well, if you if you owed me twenty billion dollars, I would hope you're like, well, I'm going to start praying my debts, right? But the whole point is, you have no need for that ten dollars that Jane owed you because you're 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 whole now. Everything you you owed was forgiven. Well, spiritually, yeah, but no, no, but, 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 but no, I'm talking like practically. That's the whole point of that story. That 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 master, that slave, that master owned that slave. That slave. That master took care of that slave. He's no longer necessary to pay anything back. Right. He has no need. His family's taken care of now. He's back to full. Well, yeah. Right. So why would you need the ten dollars then from Jane? That master's still providing for you, giving you food, giving you shelter, giving you everything you need for your family. Put it in the bank and make money. Huh? Well, but, but see, that's, but that's the thing, though, right? Well, wh- what about why? Monopoly? That doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe Monopoly's not the most virtuous. Yeah. But see that's, see, that's what I'm saying, though, right? It's like, well, that's, that's the whole point. That's, now, you're, you're not only physically, like, practically speaking, in a good spot, spiritually, you should be too. Good. Any other questions, comments, concerns, heresies? Very for discussion. A new way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. It only took 35 minutes. My grade for me, real quick. Do unto others as you would want them to do to you. Yeah. I mean, at the heart, that's what that, yeah, yeah that's what it's all about. If you receive great mercy, well then. The thing that I didn't understand in this story, though, was that first servant, when he didn't get the money, he had that second servant that owed him money thrown in prison until he could pay his debt back. Mm-hmm. Where the heck is he going to get the money in prison to pay his debt back? Well, the whole thing, so that, that concept when it comes debtor's prison, is they would the idea there is that you would just serve your time and they would they would they would attribute some amount to whatever time you were tortured, right? It's a monetary so, amount at a time. Yeah. So so in reality, you're talking about like you know you heard about the term pound of flesh. That's kind of what I was going towards when it comes to basically being tortured. It's more like retaliation. Yeah. But but that first servant still didn't get anything back. Right. The second one. But that's the whole point. He didn't need anything back. That was the whole idea. It's like you. Well, what do you need it for? You know. So now he's persecuting this other fellow servant who owed him much, much less right. than you owed this master. And, and now, now that's even wiped away anyway. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. That he wins and turns around and does this very vengeful thing for no reason. But thinking mathematically, this servant was in the red. And the master brought him back to zero. Okay, but but you're talking about in the red so much 
that you couldn't pay it back over like a hundred lifetimes, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about your children's children, children, children be paying back this debt that was wiped clean, done. And so now you're going to another server who maybe, yeah, okay, fine. I now have $10 more than I had before, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really more like a drop in the bucket because you have, the, the whole thing about this is that you don't need the $10. Especially, so part of this may be part of us understand as Americans living in the 21st century, when you're talking about a slave, a slave worked for a person, didn't get paid, but they were provided for. Now, that's the, so particular slaves maybe were put in higher positions where they could actually take their master's money and become stewards of it to make deals, to, to maybe make profits. So what that really means is this servant probably had some skill in his depth and, and, and aptitude for, for maybe money handling, but he caused this huge debt, right, that could not be paid off by him or his children, 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 children. So even in the midst of this, he was still being provided for by this master, right, his family, but, but because of this debt, the master said, well, I gotta recoup something, so I'm gonna sell you, I'm gonna sell your family off to all these different people. So I can get the money, some money back for what you've done to me. And that master could be, the master they go up to could be worse than the one they have. So the whole point of that story is that there were, this person was actually the point where they were back to where they, back to where they, they before they, they were back to a state where they, they couldn't have been otherwise, mm -hmm. right? And that was a pure gift. That was a pure act of grace. And that's what's represented the pure act of grace that God gives us. That when we're forgiven in the sacrament, we're back to our original baptism. Which is actually not very, in a very high state. So when we start sinning again, well, that's a problem, right? Is that you should show true contrition, true repentance. That's what the story's trying to convey. Yeah, for a math, math, okay, I'll have 10 extra dollars. But the, the, the whole point is, well, you don't need the $10. You're being provided for by your master still. And your family's still together. And you're still being, you're still having your position with that master. Which seems irrational. Okay. Right? Yes, so the debtor's prison was really kind of like, that was a place where they would go and get, they paid off through Time. Th their torture or sort of like some kind of very, you know, base labor that was not very fun or good. Yeah. Do you have a question, Mom? You're about to say something, sorry. No, well, that, I think you explained it to me. What? Yeah, I mean, that, that's leading up also to this weekend's, um, um, well, depending on which math you go to, if you go to any Mass this weekend other than the 11 o'clock Mass, you're going to hear the, the Gospel of the Prodigal Son, which again is another parable about mercy and forgiveness. He went off and spent his dad's money. Yeah, and the point about that too, which is what he's basically telling his father is, um, I wish you were dead. To ask your inheritance at that time and basically saying, I'm just assuming you're, going to, you're dead now to me. I was going to take what's mine, you're dead to me, I'm not going to ever come back to you. As if, as if you were buried in the grave. That's what the, that's what this, the son is telling to his father, by asking for the inheritance. And that's compared to the mercy of the father upon his return. That in that respect, the, the son was just looking to go, I'll just become one of your slaves, at least I'll get fed. Right? But again, the father puts him back to his original state. <clears throat> more than he expected. But then the other son. Now that, I think that's gonna be the top of my homily actually. Oh, okay. um, so I have the 6.30 mass this weekend. So you know, at the 6.30, I'll see that. You'll, you'll probably hear more about that. You must be so saintly either. Well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. 
He had a point, didn't he? Yes, he did. He had a point. I've been with you all the time. Yeah. I did everything that I didn't leave you. you. And you're so alive to and me. You're uh, right. having given me a thing. Mm -hmm. But isn't he intimating? I wish you would have, or you should have. Well, I would have been happy I, with it. I'm not going to. I don't going to say too much because. Again, my homily is going to be focused on that older brother. You've got everything. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm, I'll, I'll, that's going to be part of my homily. I don't want to give up okay. too much, though. Okay. So okay. I hope people fall asleep during a 630 man. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Here's somebody snoring. Right. <laughs> Very good. So I've been paying attention more at Mass the last awesome. period. Wonderful. <laughs> I mean, to details. Mm -hmm. kind of a couple of weeks ago, you said when the priest first comes out to say mass mm -hmm. and he goes and kisses the altar he puts both hands on the altar oh, doesn't necessarily be both one. hands could be one, one. Necessary. okay well i remember you saying two is it two no well i mean it's more it's a better symbolism for two because it's like you're embracing the tomb but the rubric says the priest should place her hand which i think is a germ says the priest should place her hand on the altar no. Okay, because some do and some don't. Some do, yeah. Well, the priest should only put one hand on the altar. Yeah. All the priests should. I mean, so it's not, it's not, okay, so let's put this right. It doesn't invalidate the Mass. Oh, it's still the Mass. Yeah. Um, but the rubric does state one hand at least for a better which hand? No. Your right hand. You right, yeah, I mean, right hand would probably be a better symbol. Right. Left-handed, though, it's just kind of automatic. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but it's really, I mean, I, I always try to use at least two because you're really supposed to be embracing the two. That's kind of the idea behind that. Um, I think sometimes you use one. I don't know. It just, just yeah, it depends. But I always picture. Now, deacons don't, right? They just right. kiss the, the, the altar and move on. Um, but, yeah, I mean, is it is it illicit? Yes, but is it a willful? Is it a willful thing or just like an, a, an ignorant thing? I don't know. You have to ask the individual priest about that. Okay, so when you do the Lamb of God right before communion, mm -hmm. what does the priest hold up? Um, the host and the chalice. Okay, right. Is that what you're supposed to hold up? Um. Are there any I think the rubric says it's just maybe the, it could just be the host, but it's supposed to be over the chalice. So, in other words, if you put the chalice on the corporal, you'd have to want to have the host above the chalice. Um, I think that's what the rubric states. I gotta go back and look at that though. It doesn't really make any difference how high you hold it. I mean, no, you could just no hold it. I mean, so different. like I said, if you, if you the extraordinary, the extraordinary from the rubric is much more particular. Like he even says, like if you were if you were to read the extraordinary form uh, missile, the night six U missile, he even says like the priest should make the sign of the cross over the corporal, put it on the corporal, make the sign of the cross. With the, I mean, with the with the patent, it does all these actions that you would never see, because the, the priest would be facing the tabernacle. You would, right. you know, but that's much more particular about what you hold up, what you do, right? The novus order of the rubrics are much more uh, reduced. So, like, for instance, like during the during the consecration, all it says in the rubric is the priest shows the congregation the host. So it doesn't say lift. It says, I mean, this would be, this really would suffice, right? Um, same with the chalice. It just says the the priest shows the congregation the chalice. But so that's it. Now, a lot of priests hold it up that way because in the extraordinary form, it says the priest uh, elevates the host so the people can see it, but but. In the story form, the back would be to the people, so they had to hold over his head so people could see it. Which is why most priests do it that way, right? Now, um, but yeah, I think for the Lamb of God, I think it's it says uh, you should the, the broken host should be shown over the chalice. If I'm not mistaken, I go back and look at that. But yeah, okay, right before the distribution of communion. Mm -hmm. There is an extra prayer that is said. Yes. By the priest silently. That is correct. Right. By the priest. 
When is that to be said in the sequence of events? And you, do you say that after you consume the blood or in between the body and blood? Okay, so there's, okay, so there's, there's, it depends. So after the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb takes away the sins of the world, right? Um, before the priest consumes, he says, by the, the, by the, by the body of Christ, my sins be wiped away. Right. Puts in the then with the, through the blood of Christ, my sins be wiped away. So there's two separate prayers, one for the host, one That's for the child. That's not the prayer I'm talking about. Okay. The prayer I'm talking about is from the book, from the missile. Oh, the well, those are both the communion from the book. Well, okay, maybe antiphon. the communion antiphon. Yeah. Well, the communion antiphon is spoken aloud by the, everybody. Right. But Are when is made? that said? That's said after the priest consumes. But it isn't consumes always said. Consumes what? The body and blood. The body and blood. Yeah. Right after, behold the lamb of God, behold right. the text, yes. what it's But the communion antiphon may not be said if there's a hymn or if there's something no, about no, the I, I get, but, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But even if there isn't a hymn, it's not always said. Yeah, but it should be. I don't think mine's saying there's something. Yeah. Um, I think in the rubric it states the communion antiphon should, or some other hymn should be said. Or maybe it's said silently, I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe. But I think that, I don't know, I have to look at that too. I don't think it says say silently. Because you have a silent prayer that says the priest says silently to himself or says silently. Or in a low, uh, um, in a low voice, which a, uh, um, in, uh, the fundum uh, voce, yeah. Um, so, now there's another prayer that's, that's said before, uh, behold the Lamb of God. There's two separate prayers for that, that the priest says to himself. Right. And those are said before he holds up the post and the, the chalice. After... That, that's done. There's the two prayers before he consumes. Right. Or you can combine them through the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that, that could also be if he does like intention. And then after he consumes is when this allowed prayer is said. That's when the antiphon mm -hmm. okay. could be done. Or a hymn could be sung. Right. But not necessarily, well, but not by everybody. Not by, not by each priest all the time. No, no. As long as, long as one, per, one of the priests says it. It's fine. But you, I have to go back and look. I don't think it says in a low voice. I think it's meant to be proclaimed out loud. Just you know, like the hymn you, would be done. The reason I ask that is because I've noticed there's one priest who uh, consumes the body mm -hmm. and then says the antiphon. And then consumes, then consumes the, blood. the blood. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily wrong. I mean, yeah, I have to go back and look at the rubric. What the, the actual, really, or even look at that. I just noticed the inconsistency. Yeah, I mean, even to get that depth into it, you almost have to look back in the original Latin to it to figure it out, right? Because Latin really would be the defining um, direction. You know, these are all translated. So I don't know if it gets that specific on when the communion antiphon is said or sung or whatever. But typically, the action will not. So, the whole purpose of the priest consuming the body and the blood is that concludes the rite. That actually completes the sacrifice of Jesus, right? And so, you want to make sure that's done before anyone anything else happens, right? Because if the priest weren't to consume just one or not the other, technically no one else should should receive either until that happens. So, okay, well. Is it considered an abuse to say the communion antiphon between those actions? Uh, yeah, I don't know if that's the most proper thing to do. Well, Does it, I'm not saying it's an abuse or not. I yeah. Just, it, it just, you would think it would be consistent. Yeah, and it should be. It should be. I mean, I know that when we were trained, we were trained that you should say the communion antiphon after you consume the, the chalice. But, you know, again, everyone's kind of a product of the, the seminar where they come from. And especially in the post-Vatican II era, um, there could be some, some there could have been some innovations that were brought out that weren't necessarily promulgated that just kind of caught you know people learned it that way and just kept on doing it and never really you know either thought of going back or never even considered it being any different. Um, and that that could be on a case by case basis or, or even like a an error from error basis from when people come out for particular seminaries. You know, I always say, you know, when it comes to like, particular my brother priests, uh, we're all products of the seminary we come from. 
So what, what I do was just because that's what I was taught. And what everyone else does is probably just because that's what they were taught. And is one right and the other wrong? Well, it's hard to say. Um, obviously, there's particular things that need to be done that if they're not done, it wouldn't necessarily be considered a mass. Um, <laughs> and there's other things that maybe people will do that would say, you know, I, I know there's some priests that maybe don't actually use all the words of the Eucharistic prayer, right? They don't, don't actually read all the black. They'll say, this is my body and this is the chalice of my blood, which makes it a valid mass. But the rest of the words are either something they do on their own or it's not what's actually written down in the book. Um, that's it's incredibly illicit, right? Especially if they know better. Um, but if that's what they learned, I don't know, right? If that's what they learned, how could it be illicit? Well, because the church has specific mm -hmm. rubric and direction that is really that needs to be done, right? Yeah, and things do change, but that's always promulgated. And it's up to the priest to be on top of those changes. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, we saw that happen in 2011. There was a lot of men that end up retiring earlier, end up, you know, kind of stepping out for a minute because they weren't, they couldn't get used to the changes that came from the new translation of the of the missile. Well, like, okay. For instance, we used to say, Lord, I am not worthy to receive you. Mm -hmm. And now we say, Lord, I'm not oh, worthy to receive you. And see, part, part of that's because if you look at the original Latin, that's a better translation. The words of the centurion, right, in that gospel, that comes from, all comes from the gospel. And the, the words of the centurion are actually more in line with that than the original translation. But possibly we said, Lord, I'm not worthy for you to, not worthy to receive you mm. for centuries. Right. <laughs> but here's the thing. And now we're doing it so, better. So here, but here, no, but here, here's really the question. <coughs> Does the church have the right to change those things? Well, sure. Sure. And for 40 years or so, the translation that was approved by the bishops and promulgated was that. Now, for whatever reason, someone went back and said, ah, that's not really the best translation. But that, is it possible that, that 100 years down the road? Change again? Yeah, that it could go Maybe. back. Maybe that whoever whoever the human beings are who are around that yeah. decide it was better. I, it, it, that could way. Be, it could be a possibility. I mean, the, I think the issue there would have to be some good reason to show that. And so here's here's some of the struggles, right? A lot of the stuff that we have in the liturgy or in the Bible, for instance, because everything we have in the liturgy comes from from the Bible in some way, some form of scripture. Okay, well we have to look at that. The original writings of these were in, in Hebrew. Then they were translating the Greek. Then they were translating the Latin. And now they're trying to be translating to Spanish and English and Italian and French and Swahili and you know Japanese. And so you're going to lose some meaning in those translations because that's just the nature of translations. There are words in Greek that we don't even have in English. In order to have in English, you don't have in Greek, right? So trying to find the best word, and a lot of these 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 languages we're using right now. Well, no one's heard them spoken in 2,000 years, right? So, okay, so a lot of it's just the best guess from the time going back to, to history and archaeological understanding of what these words mean. And so, yeah, maybe it could be possible that they find a, a, a better translation for a more ancient text that has a better meaning than we're using today. Maybe that could be the case. I don't know. That's open. That, that is a possibility. But the point is, that have to be proved and promulgated by the bishops, uh, the Holy See and the bishops, for that to be the case. Would it ever be possible that they would all go back into Latin throughout the world? Well. If you read Sarko Sarko Chilium, that was the intention, right? But that wasn't the original. Why not go back to Hebrew? I mean, nobody well, the, the original masses were done in Aramaic. Why not go back to Aramaic? Why not? That's a good point. I mean, you could. Well, so in some places, in, in different rites of the Catholic Church, they are done in Aramaic. 
We are the Latin Rite of the Catholic Church. We have a Chaldean Rite of the Catholic Church. We have a Ruthenian Rite of the Catholic Church. We have a Ukrainian Rite of the Catholic Church. We have an Ambrosian Rite of the Catholic now, Church. Now, have those rites gone into the vernacular or not? No. They did not. They are not. Just only the Latin Rite. Yes. So, yeah, I think it's pretty clear the intention of the fathers of Vatican II were that the vernacular should be used for to learn what's happening in the Novus Ordo, but then return to the Latin. Now, there's a you know we're having these Latin classes on Sunday night at seven o'clock because we're getting ready to have a a, a, a Rorate Celli Mass in December. So we're going over the parts of the Mass in Latin and talking about those and translations and blah, blah, um, And one thing that, that I brought up in those classes is that, you know, there's a big, there's kind of a catch-22 involved right now because um, the idea was everyone learns in English what's happening and so we, then we can start going back to Latin. Well, why haven't we done that? Well, we haven't been teaching Latin in the school. Well, why would we teach Latin? Well, we don't use it in liturgy anymore. Why don't, why don't we use it in liturgy? Well, we're not teaching Latin anymore. So you get this, this, this you know, vicious circle, which that's what I'm trying to break on our Sunday night sessions, that we actually learn the Latin in the Mass, so that we could maybe at some point go back to using it the way the Vatican II intended. And the Rote Celli Mass may be a good introduction to that for the community, We'll see how that goes. Um, but that's kind of the intention of those Sunday night sessions. You almost have to really learn not only the Latin, but then also immediately translate it back to English so that... Well, here's the thing. The everybody, everybody knows what it is in English, right? Right, but... I mean, if I say, in omni patri et filius et spiritus sanctus... Name the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Those kinds of You know the response, amen. And then I said, don't use from school. I mean, but you know at least the English is like, I know oh, that means with your spirit. I at least know that. Right. So yeah, I mean, every, the thing is everyone knows the English. But now the just putting the Latin to the English. Would you be saying the, um, the epistle and the gospel in Latin too? No, so actually, no, you, you could, but that was never done in the extraordinary form either. Right. So it flipped back and forth. So there were some, so especially like low masses, they would usually use vernacular for the readings anyway. So that wouldn't necessarily be a deviation from that old, old way of doing things. And because people should know what the readings are anyway. Now you could do it in Latin, sure. That's a possibility. But that was even done in the extraordinary form of the Trinity Mass. You would have the vernacular readings, but all the mass parts and everything else would be in Latin. Okay. Yeah, you could go to an extreme and do the homily in Latin. You could, and some people do. And I've seen I've seen an extraordinary for master where the pastor does both English and Latin. Now that's getting pretty extreme. Uh, but also, too, in the extraordinary form, <laughs> a Latin is, a, a homily is never prescribed, even on solemnities and and Sundays. Now, in high masses, it should be done. But if you had a low mass on Sunday, not doing how many? I think I was at a mass someplace, and homily was like every paragraph was English and then in Spanish. Yeah, in yeah, I see that sometimes too. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, well, they they would translate back and forth. They would first paragraph English, paragraph Spanish, and then yeah, they would do that. Um, so, no, but, but to that point, I mean, yeah, uh, I think, so for the, for the uh, Rote Celli Mass, we've already decided we're going to do the readings in English. We're not going to do them in Latin. Now, we might do the, we might do the responsory in Latin, but the uh, verses of the responsory are in English. And when is that Mass? Uh, it's December 16th um, at 7 p.m. So. Which is a Sunday? That's a Friday. That's a Friday. Yeah. So that's the plan. We're going to, we're planning to do an evening, figure more people come to that. And it has to be after sundown, because it's all lit by candle. There are no lights other than candles being used. We might have like a, might have a flashlight for the pulpit, but that's about it. 
Um, so yeah, so so that's kind of the problem is that we have this kind of catch twenty two going on right now. And so yeah, I think we, I think, I think the future is going to show, especially with the directions coming out from a lot of men ordained in the last decade or so. That's going to be the future. I think we're going to see more pastors, more priests trying to implement that more over the next couple generations. So we might as well be ready for it. And the reason being, that's the way it was to begin with. Well, that's the way that the... So when the Novus Order was actually promulgated after Vatican II, the the, the document that um, was the governing document stated that pretty clearly. And so it was pretty evident the intention was that, yeah, okay, we're going to learn it in English first so everyone knows what's happening. But then we're going to go back to Latin. So it was assumed it. that we didn't, that all of us who were had these missiles with Latin on this side and the English on that, that we didn't know it. Well, I think it was assumed that people knew Latin. So I think that's the assumption. Okay, but then yeah. the reason that it was changed temporarily is why? Just so people could know what's going on with the new form of the Mass. And then the intention was to go back to Latin. Now, they would never said, never gave a time frame on that, right? They never said, we're going to wait like 20 years. So the new form years. of the Mass was like the priest turning around and having the altar. <laughs> is that... Yes, uh, I, okay. Um, what I, so what is the new form of the mass? The new form of the mass is what we call the Novus Ordo today, right? Now, you mentioned two aspects we see today in the Novus Ordo, meaning what we call the propopulum, meaning the, peop, the priest is facing the people instead of ad orientum, where the priest is facing the tabernacle. Um, the other thing that was sort of a novelty that was never actually promulgated was the removal of the altar from the tabernacle. Now, a lot of churches prior to Vatican II um, were built that way, with the, the, the altar coming away from the tabernacle. But that was never something that was actually promulgated in the governing documents. It just could become something that was kind of accepted. Um, in canon law, there's this term that's called MOS, M-O-S. Must be U-S-T. <laughs> no, M-O-S, MOS, MOS. Which means? MOS means a uh, tradition, yeah. right? So what that would state is, what the canon law states is, that if something were done in a particular parish, with the bishop's under knowledge of it, for more than 35 years, that then becomes canon law. So, these churches that were built prior to 1965, a lot of them, including my home parish, had the altar removed away from the tabernacle. The bishop obviously knew about that because he probably had approved the plans that was promulgated throughout the rest of the bishops after that for 35 years. Okay, that's the way they celebrate Mass in that particular church. Well, here too. Here too. Okay, before Vatican II, if the altar was removed from the tabernacle, the priest still faced the tabernacle. Yeah. And all they did after Vatican II was move to the other side. Correct. But even that was never something that was promulgated in Vatican II. Nowhere in Sacro Sacrum Chile we see the priest should face the people. But again, that was something that was started, that was yeah, done, did it. and became moss. So, all right. Tradition. Mm -hmm. 35 years. Huh? However, when Jesus was at the Last Supper, his back wasn't to the apostles. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, it would have been silly if his back were. True. But the, but the idea and behind... Isn't this the Last Supper well, for us? The, the, behind, the, the idea there, though, would be... Yeah, but the, tabern the table also is on... You're, you're looking at it more from God's perspective than from ours perspective, right? So what, what, the, what the idea there is that we're all worshiping as one body together 
oriented in the same direction. And the priest is our leader. And the priest is the head, representing Christ, right? And so that's the idea behind the ad orientum, is that, yeah, we're all facing the same way. Turning the priest towards it becomes more of a focus on the priest. Now, there's some good about the propaganda. There's also more focus on the sacrifice that's happening on the altar, which is good. But there is also critique saying that it's become more focused on the priest than what's actually going on in the sacrifice of the mass. But you can also hear the priest better if they're facing you versus... Right, too, that's and, true, and but the also... the priest is doing what Jesus did. He's... Offering the sacrifice. Yeah. Right. right. With everybody else. It's a corporate, it's a corporate uh, sacrifice, right? That just right. as the priest is offering the sacrifice of the mass, the people are offering their own spiritual sacrifices through a common priesthood, right? So, I mean, there's, there is a little more unifying symbolism there. Um, now, to your point about hearing, well, yeah, but see, part of that depends on how the churches were designed. I mean, typically what you find with these older churches, the acoustics were such that really no one really had even trouble hearing things even without, with the, without a microphone. Because, of, but also too, a lot of the stuff that's happening there, they're not meant for people to hear. In the extraordinary form of the mass, a lot of it is what you know, uh, 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 the fundum voce, like a low voice. It's the priest saying to himself or to the server. It's not meant for everyone else to hear. No. They're just meant to offer spiritual sacrifice and witness what's happening. Witness, but not hear. Well, you can still witness without hearing. But you know, if you have your back to us, mm -hmm. the only thing we can witness is when you hold the host of right. your head. We can't see all of this stuff that you're right. doing in front of you. No, you're right. You're right. But part of that's trusting that priests do what they're supposed no, no, to be doing. Yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> you still have to faith, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. But yeah, but you're still witnessing this is the body, of, you know. The body and then the blood. The blood, yeah. right. But other than that, see, what, 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 what more do you need, Paul? Well, <laughs> I think it's, it's kind of nice to see what's going on when he's facing you. Oh, yeah. Look. It's easier to concentrate. Well, yeah, and, don't, and, don't get me wrong. I, I mean, there's advantage to disadvantage. Don't get me wrong. I think, I think that's absolutely right. You can see what's going on. You're witnessing the actual sacrifice and the actions. I think that's a beautiful thing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Right. The, the, my other comment would be this. Um, the Catholic Church, as you well know, is losing lots of people, mm -hmm. uh, especially the younger ones. Mm -hmm. And I think if you turn your back so that people can't see what you're doing, and they're 12 years old and 8 years old and 4 years old and, and whatever. Well, okay, my, my, my response to that may be uh, twofold. There's something mysterious about that, right? Part of this is understanding the mystery of the faith that's actually happening, right? And there's something mysterious about the fact that, well, I know we brought wine and bread up there at one point. We're bringing it up. Now, now it's the body and blood of Christ, right? The other aspect I just maybe would push. But I, but I didn't see what he did because it was so secret. Right, right. And this isn't like an initiation into a fraternity. And it's, but, it's, there's, there's, but there's something mysterious about it, right? Oh, absolutely. So, so to that point, the other point I would make is, Boy, if, if you if you were to go to an extraordinary mass on Sunday, extraordinary form, you see nothing but young families there. That's what I hear. Yeah, that's what I hear. And, and so, they're all dressed up. And they're all dressed up. Yeah. They're all they're all there, and and all different ages. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. But what really percentage people. of Catholics are they? This group that does that. Well, I think there's there's been a larger and larger number going. To those types of masses of younger families. Yeah, I've heard that too. And so, yeah, it, it may be. Um, so, this is the Latin mass you're talking about? Yeah, it's running form. Yeah. Now, so, yeah, to that point, yeah, maybe it's, I don't know what, like 10% of the Latin rite. But if you're getting a full church every Sunday for every mass you celebrate that rite, well, should we be then trying to limit that? In some way, we should try to expand it. 
There's an argument to be made. I don't know. I don't know. Well, it's interesting. I wonder, was there anything like that when it changed from Latin to English? I think maybe initially, I think one thing that the Novus Ordo did, um, well, I should say it's the Novus Ordo. I'm saying, I think one thing about the pro populum and um, the, the altar you know, you know, moved away from the tabernacle, um, no vernacular, it caused, I think, a better familiarity, mm-hmm. which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing. But I think we, we tend to have these pendulum swings where, in some respects, there's too much familiarity with what's going on in the sanctuary. Whereas if you go to an extraordinary for mass, after mass is dead silent. Right? There's time for Thanksgiving, prayer of Thanksgiving. There's a recognition of Jesus there. There could be personal relationship there with the, the present. But with the Novus Ordo, it's almost to the point where there's not a lot of activity after Mass except for um, conversing and engaging in fellowship, which isn't necessarily bad either. But sometimes there's maybe a lack of understanding of what is present in the tabernacle. And it's almost kind of gets the point. Like, so, for instance, this morning at Mass, at the, at the 8 o'clock Mass, we had the K through 4 kids, the first and 4 kids. Great, fine. A lot of parents are there, great, fine. At the 8 o'clock Mass, instead of like, you know, a, a soft tone of silence, there was a, a kind of a flow of voices and conversations and loudness. Now, again, you could say, is that a good thing? Is that a good thing? You have people in the church actually conversing and having fellowship in front of our Lord. Okay, but also, where's the solemnity of recognizing what's actually, who's actually here? Well, how can you foster solemnity and community both? Well, I think, I think it's, like I said, I think it's hard here to do that because we don't necessarily have any other space, right? right? Now, growing up in Macleod, Heart of Mary, um, they had the gym open after Mass. So if people wanted to converse, they would go across the parking lot, have a conversation, have some coffee. Great. Um, but there were still people even there that would just have conversa- loud, loud conversations in the nave. People start talking immediately after Mass is over. And the priest is out of the sanctuary. The, priest start, I mean, the people start talking out loud in church right. before... Yeah. And I mean, if, if we're, I mean, the circumstances matter too. Like, you know, say it was a little rainy outside. Okay, so I understand. If you're, okay, you know, sure. You don't have any place else to go here. I kind of understand that. But, but I also hear that Catholics don't have a sense of fellowship like other denominations have. So, okay, so you're saying we can have go have fellowship, but get out of church to do it. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is, I think I there's, there's the proper spaces where you can do that. Right. Which is what, that's what we were trying to do for the, when we were, before we actually had to put the, um, the capital campaign to Kibosh. The plan was to put a extension out in the vestibule. The narthex. The narthex for that particular space. Which would have been good. That way people who wouldn't stand the name and pray and have that silence and be with our Lord could. Yeah. And those who want to have a conversation, here's a spot for you to go. Yeah. But until then, it's either oh, get yeah. out of church and well, then... Well, yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm not condemning anybody for doing it because I, I understand the circumstances. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it'd be behoove us to try and find that space here to have that, that, those things. Because I mean, I think it's important to recognize the slumming of what happening... Yeah. And also engage in that fellowship. Because even right now, we're being encouraged through um, the Archdiocese mm-hmm. to be more inviting. Mm-hmm. But let's not talk to anybody when we're well, here. I, I'm not saying, I'm, so that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm thinking that, but I think that's the, the problem is, um, there is, there is I think, a, a, a fine line between those two. I think there's a level we can have respectful conversation in the nave. But also allow for for space for people to actually pray that want to stay there and pray. Right. And I think it'd be better if we had specific spaces for this to happen. Mm-hmm. But right now we don't. Mm-hmm. So I have two thoughts on that. Okay. 
I agree with Marilyn, and I think you should be able to talk reverently in the church. Yeah. The problem with doing that is people stay after church to pray privately, right. and you're kind of inconveniencing mm -hmm. those people. And there's there's a balance, but I, I, I agree. I, I think after Mass, if you want to stay in the church, it's God's house. That's where we need to be on sure. Sunday or whenever you go, or during the week or whatever. Yeah. As long as you're respectful and you're not really loud, but you're just welcoming. Yeah, folks, I agree with that. You know? I agree with that. And I think I think here especially, you can't help but do that. I think that's I think yeah. that's the thing. I mean, we don't really have any place here you can correct do that. So I I understand that. Um, but I think that's the purpose of why we're trying to develop that here, so we can actually have those spaces. Well, that was developed. Twelve years ago, or whatever. yeah, yeah. I don't know if they ran out of money or. Well, no. The, the, the decision behind that was more directed towards. Um, I don't think they wanted to put too much, too many projects involved. Because that's when they added classrooms. Right? Yeah, and also I think that's also the year they painted the church too, and that was going to be a big chunk of, of money, I think. So, um, I think they were they had so much on their plate they wanted to condense it out to certain things. And it's kind of the same thing here. We we probably do more, but I think the renovation of the Gabriel House and also the Narthex was something that was like, well, that should be sufficient. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. And we'll see what happens after next year with that. So as I remember, like you said, there were three projects and they were given priority. Mm -hmm. And the putting of additional space between church and the rectory in that lawn. Right. Right. That was three. That was number three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The cry room, is that used for anything now? For families? Yeah, it's open to Come you. in with their little kids. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, some people, I mean, some people use it as a bean space. The I brides know, get dressed in there. They do. Um, <laughs> don't, some don't, don't, don't the rosary people stay rosaries in there once in a while? I think during COVID they may have. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, during COVID, it was used more kind of media. I know Vince Paul's media is in there, um, Legion Mary. So it just depended on, but I think now it's now we're more open up. I don't think that's really being used as much for those type of things. It still could be, I guess. But yeah. but yeah, I mean, but as far as like making that a conversation place, that could be just difficult too. I mean, it's not really designed for that, you know. I guess you could use it, but it's kind of small. Yeah. Small and also, especially depending on when after mass, if it's still kind of <laughs> dirty, <laughs> you don't know what happened in there. <laughs> you may not want to go in there very, very, very soon after mass. <laughs> so squirrel, you know what squirrel means? Totally different topic. Yeah, yeah, off yeah. Of right. Yeah. Is there something wrong with our sound system? You know, I've heard that just over and over again. not as crisp and as clean as it used to be. Uh, yeah, actually, we, we've been talking, we get a lot of feedback on that, too. And it's, um, at first of all, it was just me, but apparently it's been happening on other masses, too. And we're, we're trying to figure that out. I don't know if there's, like, a speaker that's, because that sound system is not old. No. no. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know that Mary Beth's been working on it. I think Monsignor's been pulled into it. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Yeah, it just, you know. No, I know it was it's brought up and brought up several times. Well, when I've been on retreat at uh, at, at Founders, mm -hmm. uh, that that sound system in that church is just mm -hmm. amazingly yeah. good. And I'm just wondering why the heck ours isn't. Well, I think part of the problem is here's the thing. I, the thing that church is really not is really not designed to have a sound system. What church? Our church. Probably so. Right. However, yeah, there are sound engineers that can make that happen. Sure. Sure. Um, sure. And now that we're streaming masses, we almost we we need a sound system so we can actually pick it up and you know record it. Um, part of that too is you have kind of competing I think competing speakers sometimes where you have certain speakers for the choir and then certain ones from the altar and the sanctuary. And I don't think that necessarily corresponds well either. So I. Yeah, I, I know that's been a problem. Yeah, just an observation. Yeah, um, and I know it's been brought to everyone's attention, so I think they're trying to figure it out. Yeah. So stay tuned. 
It must be the sound system because right here I can hear every syllable you said. Mm -hmm. And in church I don't hear the ends of the sentences. Yeah, that could be me too. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's, I can hear your ends of the sentences yeah. here. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Personally, I mean, I would prefer not to use the sound system because I think it'd probably be better for people if I if we didn't. I think I reject enough where people can still hear me, even in like the back. Um, maybe not. I don't know. But uh, like when we record stuff, though, you have to use it. And if we have the choir, we have to use it. Mm -hmm. So it's and if we have people that are reading, we have to use it. So it's it's kind of one of those things where, yeah, we have, we're trying to do the we try to try to do the best we can. And I, don't, I yeah, I, it's been brought. Someone people have been positive. Maybe one of the speakers, or maybe. A couple of the speakers are out, and I'm not sure if that's a wiring thing, if that's a, I don't know. Well, I think we're trying to track it down and figure it out. Yeah. Good. Well, it's 7.53. So we're an hour and a half almost. Sweet. Okay. Any other questions, comments, clarifications? All in favor say aye. Up the next period. Thank Great. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, Have a good night. We'll see you next week. Thanks.